Okay, thank you, Donna, and thank you uh, for the invitation to present some of our work. Uh, I'm going to focus on uh, that notion of executive function uh, that's been mentioned a number of times. And you may have heard the term in other contexts. It's really one of a number of overlapping constructs, including self-regulation, self-control, uh, cognitive control, and the like. When we invoke the term executive function, we're referring more specifically to those brain processes, those neurocognitive processes that are involved in the top-down, uh, goal-directed modulation of just about everything else that the brain does. So managing your thoughts, staying focused on a task, managing your attention, uh, managing your motivations, and controlling your behavior, and the like. And executive function uh, refers to uh, processes that are similar to, but different from what we normally mean by the term intelligence, as it's measured, for example, using an IQ test. Uh, in contrast to intelligence, which has more to do with what you know, executive function really focuses on how you're able to use what you know to accomplish the things that you want to accomplish. So how you <clears throat> use your knowledge in the service of accomplishing goals. And it's often discussed in terms of three different facets or aspects. And these are cognitive flexibility, so being able to think about a situation from multiple points of view. For example, being able to take somebody else's perspective in a negotiation. Uh, keeping information in mind, keeping the current context in mind, and making decisions in light of as much relevant information as possible. And also inhibitory control, which refers more specifically to uh, suppressing attention, for example, to distracting information, misleading information and uh, resisting an impulse to respond in a particular way that might not be appropriate to the situation. And uh, <clears throat> there's been a lot of interest in recent years, as we've heard, in this notion of executive function. And a lot of that interest has indeed focused on uh, the early development of executive function skills. One of the reasons is because executive function measured in childhood has important implications for later development in adulthood. And so, for example, in early childhood, even in early childhood, uh, <clears throat> individual differences in basic executive function skills are a really good predictor of your ability to understand other people's points of view and interact effectively with them, self and social understanding. It's an excellent predictor of school readiness, it turns out, it seems to be a better predictor than IQ. Uh, if you want to figure out how well is a child going to make that transition to kindergarten. Indeed, if you ask kindergarten and uh, early grades teachers, what do you think is the most important thing that children need to be able to succeed in your classroom? They don't say they have to have basic reading and writing and math skills and the like. They say children need to be able to sit still and pay attention and follow rules. In other words, there has to be a foundation in place for learning to occur in that kind of a context. If you measure executive function in childhood, you can predict uh, adolescent SAT scores, and you can even make predictions all the way into middle age. And so here's a figure from a longitudinal study by Moffitt and colleagues in which children were measured um, across a number of years and uh, uh, effectively executive function was measured or self-control as they call it uh, here and <clears throat> and then when these uh, kids grew up and they were 32 years of age they were examined again and what these researchers found is that executive function measured in childhood predicted physical health in adulthood it predicted the likelihood of having drug related problems it predicted socioeconomic status, so educational attainment and income, and it even predicted the likelihood of having been convicted of a criminal offense by age 32 years, and that's what's shown here. You have, I think this is the laser pointer you have here. These are the children with the lowest levels of executive function in childhood, and they're up over 40% of them having uh, had criminal convictions by age 32 years. And these relations are very strong, as you can see in this figure, this is 
self-control ranging from low to high, and this is percentage with an adult criminal conviction. And these relations hold up even when you control for statistically the socioeconomic status of the childhood environment for those children and also uh, childhood IQ. Uh, <clears throat> One thing uh, that is clear is that um, executive function is, however, related to things like poverty and those sorts of things that you might want to control for. Um, and so here are some data from uh, Noble and Farah and colleagues just showing that these key skills like working memory, cognitive conflict, composite, so being able to manage difficult uh, decisions and that sort of thing and resist interference, these are <clears throat> reasonably strongly related to, uh, to SES. <clears throat> In fact, um, it turns out that uh, executive function provides some important clues about the achievement gap about which we've heard so much. These are data actually from Minneapolis uh, collected by my colleague Ann Maston at the Institute of Child Development. And <clears throat> what they show is reading achievement scores across uh, grades two through five as a function of SES. And you have here uh, are the national norms. And then when you take the uh, children in the <clears throat> Minneapolis public school system and divide them up into um, low income children who qualify for free uh, or reduced lunch and um, more advantaged children, you see that the achievement gap is not really, of course, about ethnicity or culture or something like that as much as it is about uh, uh, socioeconomic status. Um, at the very low end of this continuum, you have children who are homeless and highly mobile, who are facing the most disadvantaged circumstances among a relatively disadvantaged group. Uh, but of course, even among those homeless and highly mobile children, there is considerable individual variation. So some of these children end up doing quite well despite uh, the adverse circumstances that they face. Others, of course, not so well. And if you uh, take these mean lines, right, and actually plot individual scores as shown here, the data are all over the place, right? You've got some kids who are, you know, way above the national norm and many kids who are falling far below it. If you divide those children up um, who are homeless and highly mobile into those kids who nonetheless do well despite their circumstances and those kids who do uh, more poorly, one of the key things that differentiates this group is that the kids who are doing well, the kids who are resilient in these adverse circumstances have good executive function skills. So this is uh, the kind of evidence that researchers have taken to, to suggest that Executive function skills are an important protective factor uh, when life throws curveballs and becomes difficult for you. So these kinds of data that suggest that you can predict from early childhood all the way into uh, adulthood uh, indicate that something is stable across that age range, right? And <clears throat> of course, one of the things that's likely to be stable is uh, the environment that people are growing up in. If you're born into a poor environment, you're likely to be raised in a poor environment and so on. Uh, but there's also considerable evidence, as we heard, um, that executive function is malleable. It's something that c can be trained and cultivated, uh, not just in early childhood, but indeed across the lifespan. <clears throat> the fact that it develops across the lifespan, that it improves in light of what we know about how the brain develops, by itself suggests that the relevant neural regions continue to adapt to environmental challenges. And I'll say a little bit more about that uh, a little bit later. I just want to give you some key principles that have emerged from recent research in uh, developmental neuroscience, so the study of the developing brain. One is the brain is clearly an inherently adaptive organ. That's what it evolved to do, to be able to adapt to changing environmental circumstances to help the individual face challenges and survive. Second, most of the things that we think and feel and do, indeed even our, our, our personality characteristics, can be thought of usefully as skills that depend upon the activation of specific neural circuits in the brain. And third, 
those skills in the underlying neural circuits are modifiable through experience. I like to say that we grow our brains by using them, and we grow our brains in particular ways by using them in particular ways. And some of you, I'm going to show you some data later, but some of you might be familiar with these studies. For example, violin players have a larger part of the cortex that's associated with playing the violin and, and, and so forth. So let me give you a little bit more background about executive function. What is it? What do we know about it? Uh, and, and as a consequence, what, what might we be able to do to uh, improve its healthy development? Although much of what we do is habitual, we can do quite a bit on autopilot. We multitask and not really pay attention to what we're doing and that sort of thing. We need executive function whenever we want to control our attention or our behavior, for example, in social contexts like this, resisting the temptation, perhaps, to check your iPhone or your Blackberry or whatever, or resisting uh, a temptation to blurt out an objection to something I say. <laughs> <laughs> we need executive function skills. We draw upon our executive function skills whenever we attempt to change our behavior. So if we want to modify our exercise routine or go on a diet or something like that, you can feel it. It's effortful, right? And, and that's the subjective experience of using your executive function skills, right? It's an effortful process of uh, trying to control your thoughts and your behavior in a kind of goal-directed, top-down, so to speak, fashion. In short, we can say it's essential for problem solving. And whenever we solve a problem, whether it be you know, a negotiation in the workplace or trying to figure out uh, <clears throat> uh, an answer to a teacher's question in the classroom, anything, we go through a regular series of steps. First, we have to represent the problem. We have to have some understanding of what's desired and where we are and how we might usefully get from where we are to where we'd like to be. And in light of that representation of the problem, we have to plan a particular course of action. We have to say, OK, I'm going to do this first, and then that, and then maybe we'll see if that works. But of course, it's not enough to come up with a good plan. And we all know the best laid plans go awry and so forth. And so once you have a plan, you have to be able to translate that plan into action. You have to be able, actually, to execute it in the moment. And that's a separate step. And finally, uh, it's important to be able to evaluate the results of your efforts to solve a particular problem. If you solved it, great. You can go on to something else. But if you haven't, perhaps you need to go back and change the way, rethink the problem, right? Or come up with a different plan, or try again to execute uh, the plan that you have. And failures of executive function can occur at any one of these phases of the problem-solving process, typically resulting in some kind of inflexibility or rigidity. So we might get stuck on thinking about a problem in a particular way that is not conducive to finding a solution. Or maybe we've always tried to solve these problems in this particular way, and that's just what we do first. It's the only thing that comes to mind. And we're not being very flexible about thinking about alternative solutions to the problem. Or uh, maybe we just habitually, even though we are really trying to do something different, right? We're trying to stick to this diet. We just, in the moment, don't do it, you know? And it's as if we lack the willpower to do it. Or maybe we don't really reflect on our own behavior over time and observe how maybe our plans are not serving us as well as they could. When we talk about executive function, we're talking about those basic, fundamental, underlying cognitive processes that make problem solving in this way possible. So we can ask questions like, what's the role of cognitive flexibility in being able to come up with an effective representation of a problem, thinking differently about how to solve a particular problem, how to approach it, that kind of thing? Uh, what's the role of working memory? What's the role of inhibitory control? Right? If you've got a good plan and you just keep reverting to an old habit, maybe that's something where you have to really uh, muster whatever strength you have to suppress your habitual tendency to do the same old thing over and over again. And when we study executive function from a scientific point of view in the laboratory and the like, generally what we're doing is trying to understand even more deeply, what are the underlying neurocognitive processes? What are the underlying neural systems 
that make it possible for us to engage in cognitive flexibility and then to solve problems effectively. It's long been known that executive function depends on a particular part of the brain. It depends on many parts of the brain, but especially on uh, what's called prefrontal cortex, about the front uh, third of your brain. And indeed, uh, damage to this part of the brain has informed our understanding of executive function since at least the middle of the 19th century. Some of you may be familiar with the famous case of Phineas Gage, who was laying some, he was working as a foreman, uh, laying some railroad tracks outside of Burlington, Vermont, and uh, a tamping iron, right? A three foot metal rod got blown through his, um, his uh, head, and uh, remarkably, he survived this accident. Not only that, he, he survived it with many of his basic cognitive functions intact. Apparently, he even survived, uh, I mean, he even maintained consciousness through this injury. Uh, but relatively quickly, his basic cognitive functions uh, recovered or were not damaged. So his basic memory skills, his basic language skills, and the like. Nonetheless, there were some marked changes, which at the time were described as changes in personality, right? He was a different kind of person. And uh, his attending physician now described him as fitful and irreverent, devising many plans of future operations, which are no sooner arranged than they're abandoned in turn for others appearing more feasible. So that's a pretty familiar characterization that could at times apply probably to all of us in this room, right? I mean, you know, we're all distractible sometimes more than we'd like. Certainly it applies to young children. In fact, it's it's almost characteristic of, say, preschool age children to be focusing on one thing and they get distracted and they go over and they don't follow through. But it's also characteristic of adolescents and, uh, you know, human beings in general. But nonetheless, these are the kinds of skills that fall under that rubric of executive function. In fact, there's a syndrome associated with damage to this part of the brain, sometimes called dis-executive syndrome. And, and again, by looking at what happens when uh, executive function is impaired, we get some understanding about what it is that we're doing, we may not be aware of, when we successfully uh, draw upon well-developed executive function skills and function effectively um, in challenging environments. So uh, the syndrome includes various symptoms, including distractible hyperactivity, like Phineas Gage, as he was described, cognitive inflexibility, being very rigid, thinking about things just in one way, a lack of self-awareness, including lack of insight into the fact that one has these problems, uh, impulsivity, and also something called environmental dependency. And I want to say just a little bit more about that. The French uh, neurologist, Francois Lermite, had some patients uh, who exhibited what he described as stimulus-driven behavior. So they used objects reflexively uh, or habitually in, in a particular fashion. He had one patient who'd been a nurse prior to her injury, and he brought her into his office, and he arranged some props on his desk, including a blood pressure gauge and a tongue depressor and the like. And even though she was the patient and he was the physician, she just proceeded to pick them up and, and use them on him as she had in her career as a nurse, right? So she was responding in a very stimulus-driven way, very locally, to the affordances of these particular objects and not keeping the context in mind, not shifting her perspective, not inhibiting whatever impulse she might have had. I want to give you now an example of a measure of executive function, and it's a measure that was developed for use with young children, but has uh, since been um, revised and expanded to uh, provide a, a really a lifespan assessment of executive function, as I'll, I'll show you some data across the lifespan in just a moment. And this is a measure, here's uh, the version uh, that's used with young children, or one of the versions. Um, children are shown uh, target cards that are displayed throughout the task, and then on each trial, they're shown test cards that would be sorted differently depending if you were sorting by shape or by color. And they're told initially to sort by one dimension. So for example, they might be told sort by shape. They're told 
All right, we're gonna play the shape game now, right? And in the shape game, all the cars go here, all the flowers go there. Here's a car, where does this go? So relatively simple sounding, right? But after a certain number of trials, children are told, okay, stop. We're not gonna play the shape game anymore. We're gonna play a new game. This game's called the color game. And the color game, if it's red, we put it here. If it's blue, we put it there. Here's a red one, here's a blue one, etc. And what uh, we in our lab and, and many other people now have uh, shown is that three-year-olds, typically developing three-year-olds, um, regardless of whether you start with shape or color, they typically persist in sorting by that initial dimension, even though you tell them uh, the new rules on every trial, and even though they demonstrate some knowledge of these new rules. And so I just want to show you um, a short video clip that I... Uh, Wait a second. So she played the color game successfully. Okay, so that, I think, nicely illustrates this phenomenon of an executive function failure. It's not necessarily that she doesn't know in some sense what to do or that she hasn't heard the instructions, but it's another thing altogether to uh, draw upon your cognitive flexibility skills, your working memory skills, your inhibitory control skills in order to use your knowledge in the service of uh, solving a particular problem. And uh, in contrast to three-year-olds, like the girl in the video, by four years of age, many children uh, will switch flexibly. And indeed, it seems like as soon as they see these stimuli, they, like we as adults, have some uh, understanding that, I get it, I know two different ways of playing this game. So I was playing it that way before, and now I'm going to switch and play it in a new way. In short, they seem to reflect spontaneously on their own knowledge as it is related to the uh, current challenges. Reflection changes one's perspective, providing what we sometimes call psychological distance. And psychological from a particular situation or a problem. Uh, this business of stopping, stepping back, putting things into perspective is very analogous to uh, having a, a broader physical perspective, right, uh, which provides a panoramic view, which allows you to see that, oh, maybe there are several routes to my destination and the like. In short, it uh, allows us to see the range of possible responses, and it puts us in a position deliberately to select uh, among the various options that we have. But of course, reflection's effortful, and it continues to develop uh, into adulthood. We've had an opportunity to look at uh, the development of executive function across the lifespan as part of uh, a major initiative by the National Institutes of Health. Several of those institutes got together to fund the creation of something called the NIH Toolbox, uh, which is um, uh, a set of standardized measures of cognitive emotional, sensory, and motor health and function that are informed by the latest research and the latest neuroscience, um, and that have several characteristics. They're brief but comprehensive in their assessment. They're reliable and validated. They have good psychometric properties. Uh, they're freely available to researchers, and they're inexpensive to use. Uh, they're available in English and Spanish, and they're appropriate for longitudinal or intervention research. So you can administer the same measures repeatedly to the same individuals in order to determine, for example, uh, changes over time or the effects of a particular intervention. And the key thing is that you can use the same measures from ages 3 all the way to 85, right? So you're not comparing apples and oranges when you say, we measured executive function in childhood, and then we measured it in adulthood using a very different kind of task. Uh, in addition to the dimensional change card sort, which I told you about, uh, another measure of executive function included in this NIH toolbox is uh, something called the flanker test of inhibitory control and attention, in which participants 
um, are shown stimuli like these and told to indicate the left-right orientation only of the middle stimulus. Forget about the flanking stimuli. And on some of the trials, like this one, the flanking stimuli are incongruent with the orientation of the middle stimulus, right? So they're pointing to the right, and the middle stimulus is pointing to the left, and you have to indicate left, but there's interference. And the task requires you to attend selectively and inhibit attention to these distracting uh, stimuli. Looking at performance on these two different measures, the flanker in blue, the DCCS in red, uh, scores over here, age group here from three, four, five, and six years of age, what you can see is there is indeed, as we suspected, a very marked improvement in executive function performance during early childhood prior to this transition to kindergarten. Perhaps it's not uh, a surprise that we place a lot of effort on getting kids up to the point where they can do things like sit in a circle and line up and wash their hands and so forth before they go to school. Um, but if you look beyond uh, early childhood, you can see that performance on these measures continues to improve. And as Jack Shankoff said in that video clip that you saw, uh, peak performance is not reached until the mid-20s or so on this task. And then, sadly for all of us, uh, <laughs> these skills begin a rather precipitous decline. But I should say that these data uh, are based on a, a, a broad, um, relatively representative sample and include, for example, individuals who have undiagnosed aging-related diseases and also um, include people who probably do not continue to challenge themselves and exercise their executive function skills in the way that I'm sure all of you do, uh, as evidenced <laughs> simply by being in this room. Um, <laughs> This fits with what we know about the development of the brain. We sometimes refer to prefrontal cortex as uh, last in and first out. So it develops very uh, steadily over the course of uh, childhood and adolescence and into adulthood, but it also um, is particularly vulnerable to disruption from uh, lack of exercise, including mental exercise and physical exercise and many other kinds of things, injury and disease and so forth. So, um, so the signs of cognitive aging typically overlap considerably with executive function, right? Forgetting uh, things at the right moment and you know, repeating, say, blurting things out inappropriately and so forth. Um, okay, so I wanna go back to this issue of neuroplasticity and um, say a little bit more now about what can you do to promote uh, the development, including in adulthood, of uh, healthy executive function skills. So I mentioned we grow our brains by using them. There are periods of relative plasticity, and early childhood may be a kind of sensitive period for the development of some of these skills, meaning just that children and their brains are prepared to uh, acquire foundational executive function skills in early childhood. But there's no question that these skills can continue to be cultivated uh, well beyond early childhood. In fact, uh, there's now quite a bit of research looking at uh, training executive function in childhood, in adolescence, and in adulthood. And uh, those interventions, those curricula that seem to be especially effective have a number of characteristics, and this provides us a clue about what we personally can do to uh, cultivate these skills in, our, in ourselves. They tend to uh, require individuals to engage in motivated, goal-directed activity. That's a good idea if you want to learn anything, right? To be motivated and on task and so forth. But it's especially crucial for executive function because those are just the circumstances in which executive function skills are needed. Right? When you're motivated to solve a problem and you're trying to do it. They tend to require uh, reflection in many cases. So helping people to break the habit of just uh, impulsively rushing in and trying to solve the problem in the first way that comes to mind and instead getting into the habit of pausing for a moment. It can be milliseconds, right? But pausing for a moment and putting 
the particular problem in context. How's this related to other things I've done in the past? How does it uh, relate to things that I want in my future for myself? This kind of thing. Uh, they tend continually to challenge developing skills. So as soon as you reach a certain level of proficiency, you have to have a program that then drives you to go to the next level. Very much like many video games, right? If you've ever played video games, you play at a particular level, right? And then once you reach a certain criterion of success, boom, it opens up a whole new set of possibilities. It changes the display and you get new powers and that kind of thing. And so it keeps you motivated to keep playing and keep developing your skills beyond your uh, existing levels. And finally, uh, they tend to involve lots and lots of practice, right? So just as with any other skill, if you want to improve your tennis swing or your golf game or whatever, right, you have to put the time in. There's really no shortage for just doing it if you want to improve. Okay, so I'm going to tell you briefly about one study that we recently uh, published earlier this year um, with kids. And I think many of the principles that are illustrated in this study apply to uh, research with adults as well. So uh, we uh, took kids who came into the laboratory and showed us that they were behaving like that three-year-old in the video. So they were failing, as it were, that particular task, right? They were not switching. They were perseverating or persisting in sorting by that initial dimension. And we uh, gave them practice in stopping and stepping back and reflecting on what they knew about this uh, set of stimuli. And so we also uh, gave them practice engaging in uh, verbally mediated behavior, that is to say, talking their way through the problem. Turns out this kind of problem, uh, it's not always obvious because we don't always further reflect on the fact that we're talking through a problem, but you do. And, and you probably know this. I mean, when things get challenging sometimes and you get a problem, you may even find yourself talking aloud or silently to yourselves. But in this task, if, if you give a task like this to adults, and, and it seems like it would be trivially easy, but it's not um, if you're trying to do it quickly. Uh, but it's especially hard if you ask those adults just to do something like, say, Monday, 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 while they're trying to do it. And that engages your verbal system and you see adults making errors that look just like the girl in that video. So we give them some practice. We say, oh, oh, you know, when you saw the red one, you pressed the button with red on it. That means you looked at the color. Now we're playing the shape game. That's the game with the boat and the rabbit. And effectively teaching them, do you get it? You know, if you're playing the shape game, then the red rabbit goes over here. But if you're playing the color game, that same red rabbit has to be treated differently. And helping them to get in the habit of solving this type of problem. And, uh, and then we, um, we did this as a, a proper experiment, a kind of randomized controlled trial, right, where you assign some kids to the intervention condition and various control conditions. And we had a number of different control conditions. Uh, and then we had examiners who didn't know what condition they were in, and we measured their behavior on this task using different shapes and colors, but also on other measures to see whether the results generalized and we also looked at their neural activity before and after this intervention. So first here, uh, what you can see is this is from one of the studies. We had a control condition in which participants did some, something else. They didn't get this kind of reflection training, but they had the same amount of training, uh, same, same number of trials and stuff like that. And all of these kids failed to begin with. That's uh, a criterion for entry into this study. And after even a brief intervention, in the shortest case, it was about 20 minutes uh, of playing these games with that kind of training. Uh, over half of the kids who got the reflection training now passed this task, and uh, the same was not true for kids in the control condition, although some of them improved just by chance or you know, having done it before or whatever. Uh, so reflection training improves uh, children's behavior on this task. Um, and we also measured, uh, by the way, um, performance on another task, uh, a so-called theory of mind task, in which kids are shown, for example, a Crayola crayon box. And they say, oh, crayons, right? And then we open it up, and it turns out it's got something else in it, like sticks. And they say, sticks, and they're surprised. 
And then we close it up and we say, when I first showed this to you, before you looked inside, what did you think was in it? And three-year-olds typically say sticks. Now that they know there's sticks in there, that's the only answer to any question about this box. Right? It's an example of rigidity. Now that you know it, it's hard to remember that you didn't always know it. Um, anyway, children uh, also showed improvements on that task after training on the dimensional change card sort. So there's some degree of generalization of whatever it is that these kids are learning to other situations. Uh, and we also looked at their neural activity, and I, I won't go into the details, but um, there were predictable changes that, were, uh, that we were able to observe in, um, the, uh, in, a, in a key uh, event-related potential. So that's a reflection of synchronized neural activity in the brain. And that should make uh, perfect sense. It should be no surprise. If there were behavioral changes, those behavioral changes had to correspond to some changes in the brain. But it's uh, a challenge sometimes to be able to find those changes and measure them and be able to show that they're related to the behavioral changes uh, that ultimately we care about. Uh, so even a brief intervention aimed at teaching children to reflect on the task, this dimensional change card sort, and formulate higher order rules leads to improvement on the task itself. Improvements also seen in flexible perspective taking. Uh, another way that question was asked about the Crayola crayon box is, if your friend came into the room and looked at this and didn't look inside, what would your friend think is in this box? And again, uh, trained children were more likely to say uh, crayons, right? Um, and uh, there's also, uh, as you would expect um, from the perspective of developmental neuroscience, changes in neural activity that go along with those uh, improvements in executive function performance. But plasticity is clearly not, as I've said, limited to childhood. And I want to say just a little bit about some examples um, of efforts to intervene with adults that illustrate the modifiability of the adult brain and of these uh, key skills even in adulthood. Uh, <clears throat> so some of you might be familiar with the COGMED program. It's a, a set of computerized exercises commercially available now for um, training working memory. Something like Lumosity and other sorts of brain training kinds of uh, regimes. Uh, this one in particular was developed by Torkel Klingberg uh, in Stockholm. And, um, and, and the standard protocol includes um, about 20 to 25 sessions, about 40 minutes each. And um, in one study with slightly older kids than the kids that I just was talking about, uh, Klingberg and his colleagues um, studied children with ADHD and found uh, that after training on these working memory exercises, which have those characteristics that I told you about, right? You start at one level, and once you get good at doing it at that level, you go to another higher more difficult level, and then you go on and so forth, and you do it over and over again. Um, they found improvements on a, uh, a different working memory task that wasn't trained as part of the exercises. Uh, they found improvements in a variety of other things, too, including response inhibition, complex reasoning, and verbal working memory, keeping uh, words and, and language in mind uh, so that you can use it to inform your behavior. They also found a decrease in parent-rated symptoms of ADHD, of inattention and uh, hyperactivity or impulsivity. So there's more work that remains to be done, and there have been some studies that haven't found such strong effects with this particular intervention, or they found that, yeah, we got effects, but they didn't generalize too far to other kinds of tasks and so forth. And I think people are still working out what are the most effective ways to uh, cultivate the uh, development of these skills, but I think we've already learned quite a lot, and, and we've learned enough that we can begin to do things uh, with people who, uh, who would benefit from, from this type of intervention. Here's another uh, study with adults that I just wanted to mention briefly. Some of you may have heard about this. It was uh, a study that got a lot of attention in the media when it was first published in 2000. It's a study by Eleanor McGuire and her colleagues that looked at taxi drivers in London. And in order to become a taxi driver in London, you have to pass a very rigorous test uh, demonstrating your knowledge, the knowledge they call it, of the city streets of London. And, um, 
And they uh, took a group of, uh, these were uh, male, uh, middle-aged to older um, taxi drivers and compared them to age and SES matched controls. And they uh, scanned their brains and they looked in particular at those parts of the brain that are especially important for memory and spatial memory in particular, namely hippocampus. And they found, interestingly, that taxi drivers, these 16 London taxi drivers, had larger uh, posterior hippocampi than did the age-matched controls. They also had smaller anterior hippocampi. So it's not always the case that more is better. Sometimes less is more when it comes to the brain. Um, but the point is, there's a correlation between what you do for a living and the shape and size of the relevant uh, parts of your brain. They also found that these changes um, that were observed here were related to how long the individuals had been driving a taxi in London. So that's further evidence that um, it may be the taxi driving that's playing a causal role in bringing about these changes in the brain. But the data are still correlational, and you could always say, well, you know, those people who have good spatial memory are the kinds of people who want to become taxi drivers and so forth. Here's another correlational study, a more recent one from um, Bavalier and her colleagues uh, at Rochester. Uh, and this is just a summary um, looking, again, at people who, uh, these were adults um, who had uh, reported that they had played uh, at least five hours of action video games, those uh, first-person shooter type games, right, like Call of Duty or something, um, for uh, every week for over the course of the past year. And they compared them to people who said they rarely played video games. And they looked at um, neural function in this case in um, a complex environment where they had to attend selectively. So not unlike that flanker task that I showed you, right? Where you've got distractors and you have to resist the distractors and focus on one thing. And what they found is that people who played uh, a lot of these video games showed um, a smaller pattern of activation in uh, the context of a task like this, suggesting that they were able to accomplish the task more efficiently, that they weren't trying as hard and as inefficiently to recruit neural structures that were not really well um, tailored to this particular type of uh, cognitive skill. So there's an increase in efficiency. More generally, that's what happens when you um, activate a particular neural circuit and you activate it over and over again under certain circumstances, there uh, changes that take place, for example, axons get myelinated and irrelevant connections get pruned away and you're left with a more streamlined and more efficient neural system for accomplishing the problem that you have been, that you've been practicing repeatedly. And so that's consistent with this pattern of data. So I'll, I'll also tell you about an experimental study. This was recently published just in September. Um, in the journal Nature by Anguera and uh, Adam Ghazali uh, at the University of San Francisco. And they um, used a video game that they had designed, that Ghazali had designed himself. Um, and it was a task that required some degree of multitasking. And so you have a driving component to it, and you also have a sign component where under certain circumstances you have to press this button quickly Right, if it's a green light in the context of this shape and that sort of thing. And you can either do those separately or you can do them together. There was a, a no um, treatment control condition. There were um, conditions where they got practice in just one or the other of these tasks, but not both. And a multitasking training condition in which they performed both of these tasks simultaneously. They did it one hour a time, three times a week, for a month, for four weeks. There was an initial visit, and then after the four weeks, they were tested again, and then they were tested after six months to see whether any uh, improvements might last over that duration. Uh, difficulty was maintained 
uh, via an algorithm that as soon as you got to a certain level of proficiency, it became harder, so that you were always working at kind of the limits of your ability, right? And, uh, and what they showed was, well, first of all, they found that if you just look at performance on this task as a function of age, you see that precipitous decline that we saw earlier, right, with the flanker and the dimensional change card sort. In the absence of practice and ongoing exercise, your brain, like your muscles and everything else, will atrophy. And so you have to keep using these things in order to keep them healthy. Um, this is, uh, this is the um, initial assessment. So these individuals were, in fact, about 67 years of age. So they were relatively old, ranging from 60 to 85 years. And then you have in blue the multitasking condition, the single task conditions in green, and the no training condition. And the no training condition didn't show any changes after one month or after six months, right? The multitasking condition, though, did show considerable improvements in performance on this task, and those improvements were maintained uh, for six months, at least. There were also changes in neural activity uh, using EEG that were somewhat analogous to the ones that I showed you in our study with children. And, and again, it's not surprising that there are neural changes. It's just that it's sometimes a challenge to be able to find them, right? What are exactly the neural changes, and how do you measure them? All right, finally, I want to finish up by telling you about a related kind of intervention that I think is very um, relevant to executive function and, and, and more generally towards um, uh, developing uh, uh, what is needed uh, in order to function effectively in challenging environments. And that's the construct of mindfulness. And mindfulness, perhaps you've heard about it, uh, the um, construct uh, has its roots in, in some ancient uh, contemplative traditions, some meditative traditions, but it has been thoroughly secularized as an intervention in various medical and psychological and other kinds of contexts. John Kabat-Zinn, a real pioneer in this field, uh, has said that mindfulness means paying attention in a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment, and non-judgmentally. In short, it's really the kind of opposite of multitasking. It's, it's being fully immersed in whatever it is you're doing, paying full attention. Of course, that's very, it's sometimes important to be able to multitask, but it's also important to be able to focus on what it is you're doing and be immersed and sustain that immersion for a period of time until, for example, a problem is solved. From our perspective, mindfulness may be an ideal intervention for promoting executive function uh, because it not only trains sustained reflective processing, I'll give you some examples in, in just a minute, um, but it also does that while uh, creating conditions that are conducive to uh, reflection executive function problem solving. For example, by reducing stress, we heard about toxic stress. Prolonged high levels of stress are uh, toxic in a number of ways. They undermine in the moment your ability to stop and reflect and be planful and that kind of thing if you're really stressed, right? Stress tends to hijack your attention and focus on whatever uh, worries you the most. Um, but also over time, uh, there are hormones that are released into the blood uh, as a function of prolonged stress that are quite literally toxic to neural tissue. Uh, they damage neural tissue, perhaps especially in those parts of the brain that are so important for executive function, prefrontal cortex, but also other regions like hippocampus, which is important for memory, as we saw. Uh, they also, um, these exercises, mindfulness exercises, tend to promote uh, an attitude of openness, this non-judgmental part of uh, John Kabat-Zinn's uh, statement earlier. Um, and we know from uh, a lot of research that if you're in a kind of open, curious frame of mind, if you're mildly happy, that that is uh, supportive of flexible thinking. You're more likely to be creative and think flexibly if you're generally in a positive mood and less likely if you're in a negative mood. Again, a negative mood like stress tends to restrict your range of attention and focus it on 
solving what the problem, getting rid of whatever it is that's causing you stress. Uh, so these exercises include things like um, calming down, first of all, um, paying attention to your breathing. It doesn't have to be your breathing. Deep breathing is, is useful for calming down, but you can also use that breathing as a way to encourage people to just pay attention to one thing, not necessarily you know, something that captures your attention, but something in the environment that you deliberately want to pay attention to. And then get in the habit, practice, being able to pay attention to one thing for longer and longer. And then you, the, the, so the story goes, you'll find it's easier to be able to pay attention when you're working, trying to solve a problem, listening to a lecture, whatever. Okay, so uh, participants engaged in these exercises, in our case for seven weeks, it was basically like mindfulness-based stress reduction. This is the kind of course that's available in many uh, professional development contexts. Um, and there's a series of exercises. There's often some homework assignments. Go home and, you know, when you're eating, don't read or talk to anybody. Just really pay attention to the experience of eating. And, and maybe then you pay more attention to, I'm full, I can stop eating. I'm not going to mindlessly overeat, for example. So there are all kinds of um, benefits potentially uh, associated with this type of intervention. We focus specifically on the implications for executive function and even more specifically on emotion regulation. So being able to stop getting caught up in a particular emotion and instead pay attention to the task at hand. So we had adult participants, they completed a series of tasks both pre and post training, the usual kind of study to demonstrate the effect of something like this. Uh, we had 68 adults who were randomly assigned to uh, receive mindfulness meditation training exercises for seven weeks, relaxation meditation. So they also did deep breathing and stuff, but there wasn't this focus on training your uh, mindfulness, on training your attention, sustaining your attention. And then there was a waiting list control. And in one of the key tasks that we administered, um, participants were shown uh, pictures like these that were displayed on a large monitor in front of them. And then while the pictures were displayed, either one second or four seconds after the picture appeared, but while the picture was still there, they heard a tone that was either high-pitched or low-pitched. And their task was simply press this button if it's high-pitched, that button if it's low pitch. Try to do it as quickly as possible, as accurately as possible, and forget about the picture. It's tough to do, right, when you see a picture like this, because it captures your attention, and you have an emotional reaction to it, and that further glues you to uh, the stimulus, right? But we're asking people to step back, detach, disengage, pay attention to the task at hand, despite this emotional um, environment. So uh, here's what the thing looked like, right? There's fixation point, picture comes on while it remains on. They hear a low-pitched tone or high-pitched tone uh, either one or four seconds after. And uh, what we found is that mindfulness training, but not the other kinds of um, conditions, led to an improvement in their reaction time. So they were better able to uh, pay attention to the tone and not get distracted by this emotional stimulus. Um, there were many other results that were consistent with that. For example, we had uh, people then go and rate these pictures after having been trained, and they rated them as being less intense. We also measured their skin conductance responses to these pictures, and they showed less of a skin conductance reaction as well. So they really did seem to be able to protect themselves from being barraged and having their attention hijacked by emotional stimuli in their environment. We've since done uh, some work with children trying to adapt these exercises for use with kids. And as uh, Donna mentioned earlier, um, one of our focuses here is on helping kids, but especially helping kids by enlisting the aid of their parents um, to do things like homework exercises with their kids and so forth. So, when we adapted some of these things with kids, we did things like we have the kids lie down, we put a stuffed animal on their belly, and they take deep breaths, and they can see the animal move, and they pay attention to it for longer than they otherwise would pay attention to their breathing, and we say, let's rock this animal to sleep, and you know, you start out, you do it for 15 seconds, and then you go to 20 seconds, and then 25 seconds, right? You keep stretching their ability to sustain their attention on something deliberately. 
we ring a bell, and as it fades, we have children listen to it and raise their hand when they can't hear it anymore. Uh, we do a kind of body scan, encouraging introspection, encouraging them to become aware of how they actually feel in a particular situation. So we take a hula hoop, we tell them it's sort of like at the grocery store, it comes up, it's over your, your calves. Can you feel your calves? You know, really pay attention to that, right? Ignore everything else. Just tune in to how your calves are feeling, your knees, how are your knees feeling, that kind of thing. Again, just simple exercises encouraging uh, calming down, reflecting on subjective experience, sustaining attention, and, and there were also some exercises oriented at thinking about how other people might be feeling. For example, you notice some people raise their hand sooner uh, than others when the bell is fading and that kind of thing. Uh, in, in one study, we enlisted the aid, uh, in many of these studies, we've enlisted the aid of a children's yoga teacher in town, Jesse Forston, who runs a, a yoga studio. And in one study, we brought uh, children and their parents in together to participate in uh, yoga uh, mindfulness type exercises. And um, there was a daily homework activity. There was a control condition. Um, Here's some examples of cards that we created to send home with the parents so that they could be reminded of things and given tips about things that they could do with their child to help continue these exercises and continue to practice them. Um, so before nap time or bedtime today, take 10 deep uh, belly breaths, share how it feels to breathe deeply. Oh, you know, I feel lighter or calmer or something like that. Getting more aware of, self-aware of their own experiences. And as a result, that's very much like reflection training, right? Putting them in a position to, to be able better to understand what they feel and know that might be relevant to solving the problems that they face. Um, check in with your body, this kind of thing. Practice eating mindfully. Don't be distracted. Really pay attention and so forth. Um, and in that study, we found, this is compared to a control condition, improvements in this flanker task that I told you about. So improvements in children's selective attention. Also improvements in a kind of go, no-go task where you have to respond to stimuli as quickly as you can. Uh, animals come up on the screen, press the button. Another animal, press the button. But there's one animal, a monkey in this case, don't press whenever you have a monkey appear, right? So you have to inhibit a, a habit of pressing as quickly as possible when a stimulus appears, right? You've got to be very mindful about what it is that you're doing. All right, so just to conclude, uh, executive function is a fundamental set of skills that really provides a foundation for learning other kinds of things. That's true in school. It's relatively easy to teach kids how to read and write if they can sit still and maintain their motivation and pay attention and not be disruptive with their classmates and the like. Similarly, if you want to train uh, job-related skills, you have to have these fundamental skills in place first, right? And if you're dealing with adults who, for various reasons, do not have uh, good attention skills or who are not in the habit of reflecting uh, before responding, I would argue that's where you start. First, work on those basic fundamental skills because teaching the other skills will be relatively easy once those fundamental skills are in place. Executive function is malleable, maybe especially during the early childhood years, but clearly also across the lifespan. We really do grow our brains by using them in particular ways, for better and for worse. So. We, we all, I think, would do well to be aware of that. Whatever we do habitually, we're increasing the likelihood that we're going to be doing that same thing in the future, right? And we're making it easier for our brains to do that same thing in the future. And when those are uh, skills that we want to cultivate in ourselves, that's great. But when they're bad habits, uh, it's potentially problematic. Um, training and reflection, working memory, multitasking, as I've reviewed, and mindfulness and, and other related kinds of things improves executive function. It brings about changes in neural activity, and we're learning more and more about what those uh, neural changes look like. And if you go back to the, uh, the early studies that I showed you, for example, that study by Moffitt, right, where you're predicting from early childhood all the way into adulthood, uh, the consequences of even small improvements in one's executive function skills can be potentially very far-reaching, affecting many aspects of our lives. 
Thank you. So we're going to have just a little bit of time for questions before we take a break. And the one thing I want to just, sort of, I should have said this before Phil spoke, but what you're going to hear next after the break is an example of a program, a human service program, that really has taken some of these executive function principles and built it into how their program operates. So you're going to get an opportunity to sort of just hear how it is being implemented in practice. But if anybody has a question, um, we can have just a few questions before we take a break. Anybody have any questions for Phil? Jane? Sure. Yes, there's a, a whole field uh, called neurorehabilitation that um, does just that um, with more or less success in different cases, right? If the dam it depends on the timing of the damage and the lifespan, um, and it depends on the extent and the nature of the damage. But for many um, kinds of damage, for example, associated with a stroke, um, through repeated exercise, uh, one can develop compensatory neural circuitry that allows you to do what you did before, albeit now using different parts of the brain. The brain's pretty, you know, plastic in that sense, and different parts of the brain can take over functions uh, that other parts previously had been uh, dedicated to. Hey, Bill. Thank you very much for your, your comments. I have a question about uh, readiness for some of this uh, mm -hmm. change and the toxic stressors are so uh, pronounced. Yes. Is there a readiness time or something like that? Do you have an opinion about that? Um, yes. I, I, if I understand uh, your question, um, for example, we do some work um, in a homeless shelter in Minneapolis, people serving people. We have a long collaboration with them. And, um, and we've been... Uh, working on creating a curriculum to uh, help uh, the children in the shelter in the context of the preschool that they have on site there. And one of the first things we learned was that before we can begin to practice executive function skills with these kids, we really have to help them to calm down um, because it's an extremely stressful environment and a stressful time in their lives and, you know, almost certainly they're suffering from one degree or another of post-traumatic stress disorder. And, uh, and so I think there is a kind of readiness uh, that is important to consider and, and that is related to, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about mindfulness. It's related to first having some basic ability to, no matter how chaotic the rest of your life is, to calm down and focus on one thing for the moment. And, and set aside the other concerns that one has uh, so that you can begin to take a step forward. Any other questions? Over here. Yes. Where is that being contradictory? Right. Is it just different functions that would be improved, or? Well, they're both uh, useful functions at times. And the way I think of it is uh, not teaching kids to always follow rules, for example, in that context, but <laughs> allowing them to be able to follow rules when they want to. And so adding various skills to their repertoire of skills. And I think it's useful for us to have multitasking as part of our repertoire. Um, uh, and it's useful for us also to have sustained focused attention as part of our repertoire. And both of those skills uh, depend on uh, these really fundamental processes that underlie executive function skills more generally. So um, being able to, to 
be in a position strategically to decide, okay, I'm going to multitask now, or I'm not going to multitask now, right? It's that sort of meta level of having control over what your brain does and what you as a person do uh, that is being exercised fundamentally in both of those ways. But you're absolutely right. It's an apparent kind of paradox because they, they seem so uh, opposite, and yet they both have beneficial consequences for some of the same skills that depend upon being able to control your other skills. When you, when you see that in the context of the, the you know, all the talk about the younger, whatever, younger kids <laughs> growing up with the internet and all the... Yes. Well, I think the key issue is uh, not that it's bad to multitask or that it's bad to play video games or something like that, but it's not a good idea to do you know any one thing like that all the time and at the expense of cultivating other skills that are going to be important for you. And so too much <laughs> video game playing of any sort is probably not a good idea. Um, and if all you do is always multitask and you never practice sustaining your attention, that's probably not a good idea either. I think there was a question. Sure. So we have two more questions and then we'll break. That's a really good question, and I think motivation's a key uh, piece of the story. I, I did not focus on it, um, and uh, but it falls under the set of things that executive function potentially allows you to modulate. Um, so you can upregulate your motivation uh, with executive function skills, uh, and you can downregulate it, and um, and I think that's really important. There are many ways in which motivation could come into the story. I mean, one thing that we try to do is make sure if we're comparing does this work compared to that is it's not just that this intervention is very motivating or the teacher is more motivated or something like that um, than in the control or comparison condition. Um, uh, but motivation clearly interacts with um, executive function. In fact, um, many of the fundamental aspects of executive function that develop um, markedly early in childhood, like the dimensional change card sort and the flanker, whatever it is that they're assessing. Um, uh, those same skills uh, develop particularly rapidly in early adolescence, around the transition to adolescence, when they are placed in motivationally significant contexts. So, um, you know, this is the classic phenomenon of an adolescent who can say, well, if my friends were drinking and I had to get a ride home, I would call you or something like that. But then you put them in the moment and there's peer pressure and fear and all this kind of stuff. You know, their executive function skills may fail them, right? And so it's in, it's in those kinds of motivationally challenging, motivationally charged circumstances that you see big improvements in executive function skills in adolescence. There's one question over here. I'm wondering about um, the flexibility and the, the ability to reflect that would support executive function. Is that is it, does it is study suggest a relationship or a, a causal relationship between emotional uh, positive feelings and ability to be able to erase? Yes, uh, there's a lot of work, for example, by Barbara Fredrickson um, and others uh, that uh, Alice Eisen um, and and others as well that has established pretty clearly a link between um, not uh, extreme positive moods, but mild positive moods, and flexibility and creative problem solving and the like. And it appears to be mediated by the availability of a particular neurotransmitter that's released when you're in a positive mood, and that plays a really important role in the function of prefrontal cortex, dopamine in particular. So when, when we get a reward, when we feel good, right, there's a, a small release of dopamine in our blood and that is a key neurotransmitter that allows our 
neural circuitry to function more effectively, uh, particularly around flexibility and, and, and the like. Okay, I'd like everybody to join me in just thanking Phil for sharing his with us. Thank you. Uh, that the achievement gap is not uh, strictly about ethnicity, but more about uh, economic disparity. And, um, and uh, I wanted to clarify that what I meant by that is there's nothing about, for example, being a person of color per se that guarantees that you're going to perform worse on reading or math, but rather that if you are um, in, in this society, right, then you're likely also to face uh, economic disadvantage. And it's important to keep in mind that that's in part due to uh, attitudes about race and, and the like that contribute to those economic disadvantages. And indeed, uh, the challenges that one would face go beyond just economic uh, diversity. So I didn't want to leave anybody with the wrong impression about what I meant by that. Thanks. <laughs>